Good morning, all. Thank you so much for being with us here at Fort Worth Bible Fellowship, our time of worship and praise to the Almighty God. Again, we want to welcome you this morning, praying that your hearts are prepared for a time of wonderful worship to give ourselves to the Lord. Uh, let's start with a word of praise as we have our devotion time reading from Psalm 47. Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples, shout to God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. He will subdue the peoples under us and the nations under our feet. He will choose our inheritance for us, the excellence of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have gathered together. The people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. And he is greatly exalted. Oh, won't you exalt the Lord this morning? Exalt his name. Lift him up. Praise him. Hearts that are full of joy, full of worshipful, worshipful praise to our great king. He says that he is greatly exalted. And along with the host of heaven, all the hosts of heaven who continuously praise his name, we do the same. They say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come and over and over and over again, that is the praise of the host of heaven. We join with them this morning, praying that your hearts are full of the, of the, of the Spirit of God so that we can worship him as we are. We worship him in spirit and in truth, and we thank his holy name. Father, thank you so much coming again into your very presence brought by your spirit in the name of Jesus is a wonderful privilege and honor to possess, and we thank you for allowing us very entrance into your throne room of power. We bow down before you. We lift up our holy hands, praising you, God, Thanking you so much for being the king of glory, for reigning sovereign, being in control of absolutely everything, and thanking you so much that we're able to trust you in every situation and circumstance of our lives. Praise you today, God. We ask that your spirit will rule and reign in the midst of our gathering. Your children are gathered together today, God. We're unified by your spirit. We always possess the unity of the spirit because we are one in the body of Christ so Lord have your way today be extolled be exalted by your children for Lord we've come brought by your spirit to bring you pleasure and that you would also minister to our hearts and to our minds by your glorious presence and your holy word. Thank you so much. In the name of Jesus do we pray. Amen. Again, what a wonderful time for you to be with us today. Uh, all of the saints of Fort Worth Bible Fellowship, we thank you. All of our visitors, we thank you so much. Praying that you are ready to hear from the Lord, ready to give your all to him for these 
this period of time, which is his period of time, it belongs to him. You know, our entire life belongs to God. But this time of worship is a time where it's very special because the Lord being with us and receiving our praise, receiving our worship, blesses his heart. And so we just want you to bless his heart this morning. Where you are, bless his heart. Keep your mind focused on him. Forget about everything else. Don't let anything infiltrate your thoughts other than the thoughts of God. Oh, praise his name. He's worthy to be praised. We pray that you are ready. Get your Bibles. Make sure you have your sword with you. Also, prepare your table so that we can have that time of intimate fellowship with him during communion, his holy communion that he has ordained for us. Bless his name. So we are going to start praising him even more as we lift up our voices, giving him all that he is due. Praise his name. Enjoy the Lord this morning. Yes. We love to yes. call your name. There's something we could not explain that happens when we proclaim your great name. Your great name, we love to call your name. It's something we cannot explain. That happens when we proclaim your great name. Your great name, King Jesus. King Jesus, no other name. None stronger and we call on you Things change as when we call on your name yes. King Jesus, no other name King Jesus, no stronger when we call on you Things change as when we call on One more time. We love to call your name. That's something we cannot explain. That happens when we proclaim your great name. Your great name. King Jesus. No other name. King Jesus. None stronger when we call on you. Things change as when we call on your name. Yes, God. There's power in the name of Jesus. Sing it, Pastor. Power in your name. There's power right, in his name. Right. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name. Say right. it again. There's power. There is power in the name of Jesus. So much power. So much power in your name. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name. And things change. Things change when we call you Jesus. Change when we call your name. All right. Things change when we call you Jesus. Things change when we call your name. I'm free when we call you Jesus. You're free. I'm free when I call your All right. name. All right. I'm free when I call you Jesus. I'm free. I call your name, I call your name, yeah. when I call your name, when I call your name, when I call your name, when I call 
change yes they do yes, when they you do. just call his name you know there's so much power in the name of Jesus Christ all one has to do is call his name whenever you are in a situation or, or, or circumstance whenever you want to praise him just call his name because things do change they change why? Because the power that's in the name causes things to change. So we pray that you're calling on Christ. We pray that you are realizing that the change that is coming is always sourced in the name. Won't you call his name today? Won't you praise his name? No matter what's happening, give him praise. Thank him. Show him your gratitude. Make sure that he knows that you know that he is always changing things. He's the God of change, but he never changes. He will change your circumstance. And the way he's able to do that is because he's unchanging. All things bow to Christ each and every circumstance bows to Christ. Just call his name. So we pray that you've been preparing your table. You have your table prepared as we come to this time of great intimacy with the Lord. It's not anything that we take for granted. It's not anything that we belittle or is a perfunctory activity. It is a time that God has ordained. He commanded us that every time we come together, we do this and we do it in remembrance of him. It is his holy table. It is a wonderful time. It's called communion. Bless his name as we prepare. Ten feet with blood. Scripture shares with us that on the night in which Jesus Christ was betrayed, that he took bread. He blessed it, then he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples who were with him. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. As often as you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me. And as Jesus Christ has said, let us all eat together. Then, after supper, the Lord, he took the cup, and he said that this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which was shed for the remission of sins. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. And as our great God has said, let us all drink together. Amen. Oh. I give Jesus All the stains are gone. Blues on Christ paid the price on the cross. Only God could do it, so God did. It. All one has to do is get under the blood. Be covered by the blood of Christ. You know, there's a, a great truth 
that we need to always remind ourselves of, and that is when we accept Christ and trust him for our salvation. He covers us in his blood. And so the Holy Father is able to receive us and grant us the salvation for, for eternity because he no longer sees us, but he sees the blood of his son. And the blood is what saves. So we praise his name. Thank you. Let's continue to worship him because we worship him with giving our treasures. Be mindful that God has provided for us in every area of our lives. He continues to provide. And even our being able to give to him are from his provisions. So take advantage of the online capability that is on your screen to present your treasures to the Lord. You are giving to God. You are giving to God because the treasures that he gives through you are used for his ongoing ministry. To our visitors, please continue to support your, your home ministry because as we know, we are all unified in Christ but ministry goes on every place across this planet. So where you are assigned by God, make sure you support that ministry also. But we, we thank you so much for how you supported Fort Worth Bible Fellowship during this time and ongoing. So again, he's given us the online capability. So please utilize that. Yes. What, what shall, shall we render? I render? Let's pray. Father, thank you. We acknowledge that you are our, you are our sole provider. Nothing that we have has not been given to us first by you. And then out of those provisions, you allow us to give back to you, to express our gratitude, to express our love, and just to bring honor to the king who needs nothing. We know that you don't need anything, God. So as you command us to give out of our heart's desire that it is for our benefit and not your benefit, Lead us, God, all who you have, all you have called to be stewards to administer these treasures so that you are glorified. You and you alone, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. As we're going to continue in our series. We, we know that it's been ongoing, but it is a wonderful series. We're going to touch on today. Uh, that aspect of the work of the flesh, which is sometimes elusive, sometimes uh, so subtle, and that is selfish ambition. So we're going to ask God to help us understand it even more. And also, we want to invite you continuously to our time of worship and also our Wednesday evening study. Those times are available to you on uh, the announcements, during the announcements, and also visiting our website. So please join us for, for these times of devotion, these wonderful times of worship, because we love to be together with God. Continue to praise his name. Amen. All right. Yes. Silver and gold. <laughs> Silver and gold. I'd rather have Jesus. Go ahead, minister. Than silver and gold. Fame or fortune. Nor fame or fortune. Riches nor riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus. All right. Than silver and gold. Don't give me a mountain on top of a hill. 
Don't give me the world with a shallow thrill. But just give me a savior. Give me a savior. Yeah. My life he can bold. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. Silver and gold. Silver and gold. Silver and gold. Oh, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. No fame or fortune. No riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. fame or fortune or riches untold what would you rather have elder rather have Jesus let's pray father thank you so much again coming God to sit at your feet we are so grateful that you always are concerned about us you're concerned about us because we are so valuable to you. You have bestowed in us a quality that is beyond measure. You have given us all of heaven just so that we could be with you forever. Right now, God, coming again as we ask you to help us to understand your deeper truths about the evidence of the flesh or the works of the flesh given by the evidence that we have been touching on. Lord, uh, we know that without you we're, a we're unable to overcome the workings of the flesh or the fleshly desires, but with you, O oh God, there is nothing that we can't conquer through and by your power. So Lord, uh, please, we ask that you will continue to help us and show us mercy as we, being in Christ Jesus, are covered by the King of glory. I confess my sins, God, and ask that you will forgive me and cleanse me as uh, there is no desire that I have that your word will be hindered in me or by me because we desire to hear from you and you alone. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It was a family that had three children, and they asked each one what they wanted to do or what they wanted to be when they grew up. The first said that he wanted to be a fireman because, because he, he loved playing with his fire truck. He had an ambition to be a fireman. They made sure they encouraged him in that, letting him know that he could be anything that he desired to be by the power of God. The, the, the other one said that 
he wanted to be a cookie chef. He wanted to bake cookies. Why? Because he loved cookies so much. Any kind, all kinds of baked cookies. So he had the ambition to be a cookie chef. And they told him, you can be anything that you desire to be in the power of God. The last one said that he wanted to be a pilot because he loved playing with his planes. He loved playing with his airplanes. So he said he wanted to be a pilot. He had the ambition to be a pilot. They told him you can be anything that you that you want to be in the power of God. Ambition. God calls us to having ambition. He calls us to desire to have a, an objective identified for our lives that brings him glory. Ambition. That ambition must be fed and nurtured so that it can grow ambition. But there is a fine line, a very subtle change that can occur from ambition to what God calls selfish ambition. Ambition is good. Ambition brings God glory. Ambition is what God places in us, in our hearts, to pursue after in pleasing him. But then he says that there is that selfish ambition that is sourced in the sin nature. And if we aren't careful, the ambition that we have can turn to or fall victim to selfish ambition at a moment's notice. And, of course, this selfish ambition disregards others. It disregards my fellow spiritual siblings because it is a selfishness which will minimize and exalt, minimize others and exalt oneself over others in order to accomplish the ambition. But God says that it is a selfish ambition when others are ill considered. So again, God says that in his power, doing it his way, ambition is good. But selfish ambition is not. Again, we are in Galatians chapter 5, our foundational verse. Verse 20, as we've been looking at those works of the flesh that impact our relationships, how we relate to one another in our relational family. Verse 20 of Galatians chapter 5 says, idolatry, sorcery, then hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. These are works of the flesh. And in this verse here, we see our Worship being affected by two of these that are identified and then the rest in that verse impact our relationships with one another. He's talking to believers and since he's talking to believers, we know that believers are subjected to or subject to these fleshly desires because we all have a sin nature. We aren't going to forget that. We're going to embrace that truth because that's what it is. It's truth. Embracing that truth and acknowledging that I have a sin nature 
opens the door to me receiving help from God to overcome the sin nature and the evidences of it. The book of Philippians chapter 2 is where we will be today to expand on this fleshly work and the impacts of it and then how to avoid it, how to minimize it, to make sure that we know that in our ambition it is not turned to and not turning to a selfish ambition where I am disregarding others or I am just being selfish. Not considering my brother or my sister, not considering my place in the family and how we are to, as a family, make sure that each one is cared for and looked out for and even, yes, even me making sure that the best of others is my objective or my ambition. Paul's ministering to the Christians at Philippi. And we're going to read the verses that we're going to touch on today, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 2 in the book of Philippians. Verse 1 says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Verse 3 says, let nothing be done through, and here it is, selfish ambition or conceit. But in the lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, these Christian virtues that are given to us in verses 1 through 4, this section of text is not common among believers Unfortunately, the fact that God calls us to esteem others higher than or better than myself is something that is not very practiced by Christians, not very practiced by believers, not practiced much between siblings to esteem others higher than myself. That means that I am not the one who is the muckety muck I am not the one who is the high so and so but others are esteemed higher than myself Paul starts off in verse 1 with therefore now Paul has just expounded on the sufferings of the body from external sources the body is constantly under attack Christ's body or his church is constantly under attack, and Paul talks about in the previous chapter, the last three verses, how these external attacks are real, and the sufferings that come along with them are not a surprise and should not surprise us because we belong to Jesus, and Jesus suffered. Paul says that there are external attacks against the body but he now starts with the internal attacks or internal conflicts within the body and he says that one of these is the ambition which is selfish within the body there are conflicts conflicts now he says if there is any consolation of love Comfort, consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit of any, if any affection of 
affection and mercy. So he touches on four points here as we begin what it takes to make sure that we don't succumb to the ambition which is selfish. He says in introducing the basis for this overcoming, he says it's unity, humility, and love among believers. He starts with any consolation in Christ. So we know that Christ is our consolation. Christ is, if you will, the actual medicine where as the Holy Spirit can be identified as the doctor. Christ being the actual medicine, if there is, he says, any consolation in Christ that is to shape our thinking because all these gifts that he has identified here in verse 1 which has been given to each and every believer comes along with it the responsibility of that believer or the responsibility of believers to make sure that we practice what he says is forthcoming in the verses that we're going to look at we've been given by God what's necessary for us to overcome these fleshly desires he says that we have received something and again it is the consolation in Christ now Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians that God has loved us and given us an everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. Christ Jesus is our consolation. He is our consoler. He is the medicine that we need in order for us to experience all of God's grace and his love. Now he says that this is what each believer has. Then he says to us that if there is any comfort of love. Paul in these rhetorical questions and points make sure that we understand that God has loved us so much so that there is a comfort of love that we are, ex are able to experience. It tells us that God is the God of all comfort, meaning that if you are in need of comfort in any and every circumstance or any circumstance, God is the one who provides you comfort. There are many people going through some things right now today. And that is safe to say because believers are always going through something. And believers are always in need of comfort. Because we are in this world, not being of this world, being in this world, but because we are not of the world and are citizens of heaven, God says that you need my comfort. God is the God of all comfort. So he tells us now in this passage, the word comfort, uh, the Greek word for it is Paraclesis, paraclesis. Now, this is more than just a soothing comfort. This is more than just soothing sympathy from God. You know, when you're going through something, people give you sympathy and say things that are designed to bring you comfort. But God is much more than that says that God being the God of all comfort, this word again, paraclesis, has the idea of strengthening, being made strong. What I'm going through, I'm able to be strengthened by God because of his comfort. Now this word comfort also 
in the Latin is the word fortis, which means being brave, being brave, having courage that is imparted to you because of being in Christ. God being the God of all comfort, he says that I'm more than just sympathizing with you, trying to soothe you. I am also strengthening you and strengthening you. I have given you courage. So he says that, of course, being loved by God or having his comfort causes us to be strong and brave. Then he tells us, if any fellowship of the Spirit, now he says that each believer has fellowship of the Spirit. We know that this word fellowship is the word kononia, kononia, which means sharing or having things in common. So since we have God's kononia, his fellowship, we are in fellowship with God. He says that having all things in common, sharing all things in common, we share with the Holy Spirit, we share with the person of God in fellowship, and that is why we're able to share all things between believers because of the fellowship that we have with God. Then he tells us, if any affection and mercy... Each one knows that God has affection towards you because of the simple fact that he saved you. Simple fact that he sent Jesus to take your place. Affection of God towards you, you and I have been afforded his affection and his mercy. Now he tells us that his mercy is that which is most needed by each and every one because without God's mercy, without God bestowing upon each one of us mercy, without God showing us mercy, we would be men and women, people most miserable without God's mercy. So he says that these have been experienced by believers. And if this is the Christian experience, he says... Further, that there is a responsibility because of this experience to make sure that we practice that which God calls us to in overcoming, again, the works of the flesh. Now, as we hear from Paul the, these rhetorical questions, we can also say things like, if water is wet... Then, if fire is hot, then, if rocks are hard, then, all of these statements we know to be true. Water is wet, fire is hot, rocks are hard. If we've been consoled in Christ, if we have received the comfort of God's love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, are we in koinonia with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy? Then he says in verse 2, fulfill my joy. Paul has a personal request here. As he is pastoring, as he, has, as he is evangelizing, Paul says that he wants to experience this spiritual joy that comes from the response of every believer that God has required of us as he has bestowed in us these gifts that we've just identified. He says in verse 2, fulfill my joy. And he says, do that with unity. He says four things here. These deep eternal truths about the unity 
of the body, he says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Paul says that the joy that he wants to experience is the result of this unity that is to be realized out of being unified with God. We are unified with God. And he says, since we are unified with God, there is a unity that must be evident, and it is evident in having a like-mindedness or being of the same mind. Having the same love, which is in Christ Jesus. Being of and on one accord, no division, no strife, no strain, no differences that would cause internal conflict. And then he says, of one mind. This is a deep, again, a deep abiding internal unity that is brought out here in verse 2 that Paul says, the believers at Philippi must experience. Then Paul goes on to verse 3. This is where the demarcation becomes blurred between ambition and selfish ambition. Because we have this sin nature, it's so easy to make sure that I'm doing things for my benefit only. It's so easy because of my sin nature to make sure that I'm doing things that are going to make my program work only. It's so easy because I have this sin nature to make sure that things are being done the way that I want them to be done only. It is so easy because of this sin nature that this ambition to have the walls the color that I want them, the chairs the color that I want them, all things to be how I want them only because it's called selfish ambition. It's a subtle change that occurs or can occur if we aren't careful. So he tells us, look, let nothing, not some things, not things that fall into a certain category, not things that fall into a certain ministry, not with certain people, not only with a certain group. He says, let nothing, nothing, and God means nothing, be done through selfish ambition. Now, much of what we do is not done out of love for others. That's selfish ambition. Much of what we do, of course, is to fulfill my program, my own desire to be advanced, my own desire to make sure that I'm satisfied as opposed to the consideration of others. The promotion of selfish ambition. Is a sin. Because it is out of the sin nature. Selfishness. And making sure that I run it. 
having ambition of being a fireman make sure that I'm going to be a fireman because I'm going to destroy everybody else who wants to be a fireman. Making sure that I, in my ambition to be a cookie chef, I'm going to destroy everybody else or suppress everybody else who has a desire to be a cookie chef to make sure that I am a cookie chef. The ambition to be a pilot is going to be insured because I'm going to suppress any and everything that would come against me being a pilot. Selfish ambition, not having any consideration of others, not having any consideration of others' time, talent, or treasure, not considering anybody else. Oh, this may seem extreme, but it is an, an internal conflict within the body of Christ that is most prevalent to make sure it's done how I want it done, to make sure that it goes the way I want it to go at the expense of others. Meaning that I'm not concerned about anybody else's soul. I'm just concerned about my program. Selfish ambition. Now he says, conceit is something that must be of a concern to us. Conceit is thinking too highly of oneself. Having an, excel, an, an excessive self-interest or, again, thinking that I am the muckety-muck. That all things work because of me. All things are able to be because of me. I'm conceited in my mindset. That I have a, a self preoccupation with how good I am, how, how I'm able to do things, how I'm able to make things happen, how I'm able to execute. It's more literally translated as an empty glory. And it's empty according to God because Thinking more highly of oneself is totally contrary to what he says in the rest of that verse. He tells us, but in lowliness of mind. Lowliness of mind is something that was very much looked down on in the secular world during this time when Paul was ministering to those Philippians in the Grecian area. The Greeks were very high on having a strong mind. The Greeks were very high on being, having, having an attitude that was about self-promotion and without humility. Because humility, according to the Greek world, and even according to the Western world, even according to the world at large. Humility is a sign of weakness. Humility is a sign, again, of insecurity. Uh, humility or not being humble is a sign, again, of insecurity. If, if, if I can't be 
humble, which is power under control. Because I have been given all of heaven in Christ Jesus. But as the mind of Christ is in view, where he owns and owned everything, where he is the author of all that is created, seen and unseen, his humility or lowliness is what he modeled for us and expects us to practice because we're his. But the Greek said, no, that's a, that's a, that's a least attractive thing to have a lowliness of mind. It is, it is, it's disgraceful to not be high minded, to not show power. It's disgraceful. Now, are the Greeks right or is God right? Are we right or, or is God right? But in lowliness of mind, here it is again. He says, let each esteem others. Now, we're big on self-esteem. We're big on making sure that people have a very positive view of themselves. We say many times that people have low self-esteem. And having low self-esteem, they can't function. Because the view of themselves is contrary to them being productive or to having confidence. But the biblical view of esteem is that in the power of God, by his power, that's very important, as we function in these gifts that God has outlined for us, that we are doing it in and by God's power, when we do it in our own powers, that's when we run into problems. He says, esteem others better than yourself. Oh, that, 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 that's a hard thing, Pastor. You mean I got to, I got to make sure that that one over there who has proven to be worth nothing, that one over there who has proven time and time again that they can't be counted on, that one over there that has proven and given evidence of over and over again that they aren't worth anything. I got to esteem them higher than I esteem myself? Well, Christ says yes, because you and I were worth nothing. You and I were sinners, most wretched. You and I were God's enemies, hated God, despised God, spit on him put a crown of thorns on his head, stabbed him with a spear, hung him on the cross, nailed him, cursed him out. You and I were worth nothing. But God esteemed us higher than he esteemed himself and came, took our place, or provided kononia a sharing in fellowship with him, a sharing not of some things, not of just a category of things. We share with God all things. We're in total fellowship with God. So he says to esteem others 
higher than I esteem myself. And now this is something that is circular within the body of Christ. In other words, it's not just on me to esteem you higher than myself, but it's on you to esteem me higher than yourself. Now, God says that if everybody in his body practiced this gift of esteeming others higher than themselves, others, then there would be no conflicts. We'd be falling down all over each other, trying to make sure that we made the other feel that they were more valuable than me. So if you're doing it for me and I'm doing it for you, who loses? We all are call to this that we esteem others esteem others in other words stop focusing on you focus on others Christ didn't focus on himself he thought it not robbery or something to be treasured to hold on to his position in heaven he said that this is not worth holding on to if my creature's going to die. I'm humbling myself so that I can go to where they are and bring them to where I want them to be. God came so that we could go with him. He came to identify with our lowest state. He came to identify with us who were wretched and worth nothing. He says, don't do anything out of a selfish ambition. Don't do anything that is going to be at the expense of someone else. Don't do anything. Now, he tells us that there is this looking to others as better than yourself and then he clinches it in verse 4. He says, let each of you look out not only for his own interest. Now, God says, it's nothing wrong with you making sure your interests are considered. It's nothing wrong with looking out for your own interests. It's nothing wrong with making sure that you handling your business, that things are in order, that things are done properly, that there is no confusion in your life, in your house. You got some interests. God doesn't say just throw that away. But what God does say that when you only consider yourself, when you only are concerned about your stuff, when you only are concerned about your interests, then you and I are sinning. Because he says, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also, also, also for the interests of others. Because that's what Christ did for me and you. Christ did that for you and me because we didn't concern ourselves with God's interests. We didn't concern ourselves with what God wanted. We didn't concern ourselves. We didn't concern ourselves with God's program or his plan or his provisions. We only concerned ourselves about ourselves, but God. He was concerned about our interests and esteemed us higher than he esteemed himself. That means that he was willing to sacrifice. That means that he was willing to serve. That means that he was willing to come alongside. That means that he was willing to do whatever it took to make sure that you and I experienced all that he had to offer. He says, don't be selfish. Don't let this selfish ambition destroy the unity of the body. Don't be off by yourself. Don't be selfish. 
We are believers called to work for God. We are believers called to serve for God. Don't be one who is only concerned about what's in it for you. Because that is what God calls selfish ambition. Won't you today ask God to give you the power to overcome that desire to be ambitiously selfish? Humble yourself. You may be wondering what does it take to receive this power that we've been talking about. The power is in the person of the Godhead. And the Godhead comes to live in each and every one at the point of confession. At that moment that one trusts Christ, God says that he gives all that is needed for each one to overcome. If you truly desire to be saved, he says it. There's a prayer that you can pray that will ensure your salvation. If you truly mean it, if you mean this prayer, God will save you. Father, I am a sinner in need of your salvation. And I know that you sent Christ as the payment for my sin. He is the Savior. Now will he be my Savior? I confess my sins and I trust Christ to deliver me from death and damnation for I am in need of your salvation. Thank you so much God for saving me. Now help me to live for you in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's something interesting about that prayer. It says now help me to live for you. The help only is available once you come to Christ. Without Christ, there is nothing that we can do, no good work, nothing that we can do in and of ourselves that pleases God. He needs to, to see us covered by the blood of Jesus in order for his righteous requirements to be satisfied. You can be covered in the blood of Christ just by asking. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Oh, that's beautiful. The psalmist sang for us to humble ourselves. Humble ourselves. We pray that you've been blessed this morning. We pray that there has been something that was said according to God's purposes that impacted your life. We look forward to being with you again next week as we are going to be celebrating Palm Sunday. Easter is just around the corner, corner and what a wonderful celebration of life when we consider Easter Sunday. If there's nothing else. We thank you again so much for being with us. Please come back as we continue to enjoy God. Next week, same time, same place. May his peace be with you until we meet again. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, to present you fallen before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior. Be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. All of God's people said, Amen. Blessings to you forever.
that shineth in me. Jesus is the light that shineth in me, that shineth in me. Jesus is the light that shineth in me, that shineth in me. You show up in me, you show up in me, you show up in me, you show if I walk the way he wants me to walk, he'll show up in me, he'll show up. If I talk the way he wants me to talk, he'll show up in me, he'll show up in me. If I live the way he wants me to live, he'll show up in me. If I do, 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 do what he wants me to do, he'll show up in me, he'll show up. I know that Jesus is the light that shineth in me, that shineth in me. I know that Jesus is the light that shineth in me, that shineth in me. He'll show up in me, he'll show up in me, he'll show up in me, he'll show up. I know that Jesus, 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 in the way I walk, in the way I talk, in the way I live, in the way I give, he'll show up, show up, show up, show up, show up, he'll show up. In my attitude, he'll show up in my gratitude. He'll show up, show up, show up, show up, show up. I know that Jesus is the light that shineth in me, that shineth in me. Jesus is the light that shineth in me, that shineth in me.